All right, welcome back to the third and final video on treatment effect averages. Uh, so we've been talking about how we have heterogeneous treatment effects. Each individual person is going to be affected by some treatment in a slightly different way. Uh, and when we produce a single estimate of just here is the effect, uh, we're actually giving some sort of average of the, all those individual treatment effects. So we're sort of masking a little bit of variation going on there. We talked about how we can just represent averages, right? So we've got some sort of average of uh, the overall average effect, or maybe some the average effect among some particular group. Uh, we also could have an average effect that is not equally weighted. Uh, so for example, uh, maybe instead of an average effect where uh, I have a 0% zero, a zero effect, this person has a 2%, this person has 1%, where I average all those together, uh, or a conditional average effect where I only get the average among these people and leave me out of it, I could get a weighted effect. Uh, where we're all counted, but at different levels. So maybe I get a weight of 0.1, and this person gets a weight of 0.2, and this person gets a weight of 0.3, for some reason. This is a weighted average treatment effect, and it works in the same way as any sort of weighted average, if you're familiar with that concept. So this is an average treatment effect among all the people, but some people count more and some people count less, right? Now, when do weighted tre average treatment effects pop up? It's not like you're just walking in and saying, I think this person's more important than that person, huh? So I will make them count more than that person, right? That's not really how it works. We're talking about the method itself is going to give you some sort of weighted average, and it will have a reason for the weights that are behind it. Uh, and so the first of these is called variance weighting. In variance weighting, so this is something that comes up when you add control variables. And in general, we're gonna see another way in which adding control variables or covariates is going to lead to a weighted average treatment effect in a minute. Um, but when we add a control variable, let's say to a regression or something like that, we can think about what that is actually doing. What happens when we add a control variable in a regression context or in any other sort of context where we're subtracting out uh, some sort of covariation that we've explained. We take that extra variable, we see what we can predict with it, and we subtract out what we can predict. And then we work just with the residuals. We did this all the way back in chapter four. So we can then ask ourselves, what are we still working with? Well, we're working with the residuals that are left over. Okay, great. And then what are we analyzing? Well, we're analyzing the variation in X and Y after we remove all that uh, stuff from that was dealt with the Z, right? So we're looking at the variation. Okay, great. Well, what if there's no variation left? Well, then there's not really much to study, right? And so that's where the variance weighting aspect comes up. Let's say you have somebody uh, whose uh, treatment is very well explained by the stuff we just controlled for. And we have somebody else whose treatment is not as well explained. There's more variation in their treatment after we remove the control variables. Well, a regression estimator is going to weight this person's treatment effect more heavily than it weights this person's treatment effect, simply because it has more to look at for this person. So let's say that we're looking at the effect of like what city you live in on your income or something like that, right? Let's say that's our idea. So we want to regress your income on the city that you live in, uh, and we recognize, oh wait, hold on a minute, well, there, there's probably a back door based on just the kind of person you're like. A really a, effective worker or something like that might be more likely to move to a certain kind of city, uh, and that's also related to their income, so we gotta control for some sort of individual characteristics. Okay, great. Well, once we control for those things, uh, what variation is left over? Let's say we take somebody who never moves between cities. They only live in one city. So once I control for that person, uh, there's no variation left in city to understand. Uh, whereas another person, let's say they move a lot. Now when they move a lot, after controlling for who they are, I can very much notice, hey, this person, controlling for this, who, who this person is, this person's income has to be, tends to be higher in this city and lower in this city. I can really easily see whether their income is changing as they change cities because they change cities. Whereas over here, this person, they never change cities, so I can't see whether the city has any effect on their outcomes. Uh, and so if it just so happens that moving cities is really effective for this person, but it doesn't matter at all for this person, we're only gonna see this person's effect, right? Because it is a variance weighted average. The person who has more variation in treatment after you control for all the control variables is going to count more, have a higher weight on their treatment effect in the average. Now the way that this actually shakes out mathematically is a little bit complex and probably not gonna come across very well in the video. So I'd recommend that you go read the chapter to see how this sort of pops out of the data. But that is the idea, right? We can only study things in statistics for which there is variation. If after you control for something, there's no variation left or very little variation left, that simply is gonna get less attention from your statistical estimator. And so the, it will be weighted less. It will get less weight because it has less variance in the treatment. 
Another way in which weighted average treatment effects pop up is if instead of using some sort of statistical adjustment, you're still using control variables, but you're using some sort of matching procedure. You're, you're picking a data set in which there's no variation in, a, uh, in your control variables. So uh, we're, we are, again, uh, looking at the effect of city on your incomes, uh, but this time we're going to take a person like uh, this and we're going to find somebody who's very similar to them in all different characteristics. They have the same hair color and height and gender and race and birthplace and all this sort of thing. They're just, they, we got two different doppelgangers, they just happen to live in different cities, right? Well, in this case, we are going to be counting people more if they're easier to find a match for, right? Because who's going to find a match? Who's not, right? People who find a match very easily have very easily representative values of things. It's the people with the most common race and hair color and height and etc. Those people's outcome, those people's treatment effects are going to count for more when you match in order to find a treatment effect. And we'll talk about matching in a later chapter as well. Both of these things are ways of saying that when you use co covariates, when you try to control for things to close backdoor paths, you are generally imposing some sort of weighted average treatment effect. The exact way that those weights come into play uh, is going to be different depending on the way in which you incorporate your control variables. Using something like regression is going to introduce variance weighting. Uh, using something like matching or picking a sample uh, is going to introduce some sort of representativeness weighting. And both of those are weighted average treatment effects. That brings us to rule of thumb number three. Remember, we skipped rule of thumb number three last time. Uh, we're coming back to it now. And that is this. The rule of thumb is this. Whenever you are controlling for variables in some way, either adjusting for them in a regression or picking a sample, you are, in general, introducing some sort of weighted average treatment effect. That's rule of thumb number three. All right, the last kind of average treatment effect that we're going to be talking about is the local average treatment effect. Uh, so the local average treatment effect tends to pop up whenever you have some variable that sort of influences treatment, right? You have some sort of variable that randomly influences treatment, and you're going to identify the effect by isolating just the variation in that treatment that is explained by that source of random variation. This is sort of like what we talked about in the last set of videos on front door paths, finding front door paths. When you have something like that, and you're isolating just the part of your treatment that is explained by that random variation, well, what if different people respond differently to that random variation, right? What if, for example, uh, you, you're doing an actual randomized experiment where you tell some people to exercise, you say to other people, hey, don't exercise. Uh, now, some people are going to do what you say, uh, and some people are going to be like, well, you know, I always exercise. I don't care what you're randomly assigning to. I'm going to keep doing the thing no matter what. Uh, now, for that person, they're not actually going to be affected by your random variation. So, when you isolate just the part of treatment that is driven by a random variation, that person falls away. And in fact, the more strongly you respond to the assignment, the more strongly you're going to be weighted in the effect. If you don't respond at all, you get a weight of zero. If you respond a little bit, you get a little weight. If you're very responsive to that assignment, then you are going to be weighted a lot. That is the local average treatment effect where your weight is based on how local you are, how responsive you are to the assignment to treatment. Uh, and that's rule of thumb number five. When you have a random source of variation uh, in, uh, in your treatment and you use just the part of your treatment that you can predict with your random variation, you will tend to end up with a local average treatment effect. All right, we've covered a lot of different ways in which we can take a single causal estimate and figure out, well, who exactly is it the causal estimate for? which is an important thing that we need to think about, especially if we're going to actually use that effect in any way, right? These different kinds of averages are going to imply different things about what we can do with the causal effects. If you want to apply a treatment to everybody, then you probably want to know what the average treatment effect is because everyone's going to be affected by it. And so you want to know what the effect is for everybody. If you're only going to apply the uh, estimate to a particular group of people, then you probably want a conditional average treatment effect. You want the average treatment effect just for the people you're actually going to treat. Uh, let's say you're interested in knowing what, a, what an, a policy actually did in the past rather than what it will do in the future. Well, in that case, you want to know what happened to the people who were actually treated. You want the average treatment on the treated. Uh, what if you are going to implement a policy uh, by asking people to participate in that policy? Well, you'd probably want the effect among people who are most likely to listen to your assignment to treatment, in which case you might want the local average treatment effect. None of these effects are wrong. None of these effects are better than the others necessarily. They just do different things, and it's important to think about which one we are likely to get. And if we don't want the one that we're going to get, we might need to think carefully about whether the research design we have in mind uh, is going to lead us to a bad place based on our rules of thumb, or perhaps if we just need to think about an estimator that will get us the kind of treatment effect average that we actually want. But in that case, you got to really think about uh, what, it, what that's doing and look at the papers that discuss those estimators to, say, to figure out what kind of average it is giving you.
All right, that's it for this chapter. Uh, thank you very much. Thank <music> you.